Well, uh, hi, it's great to see you and welcome to Summit. It's great to be here with you and great to see lots of familiar faces back again for another year and lots of new faces here for the first time. And uh, welcome. If this is even your first Christian Union or Cross Cultures event, uh, it's really great to have you with us. And I'm really hoping that this is going to be a great week. Uh, when I became a Christian in my first year of university, I, I didn't go to the summit conference that year. I didn't go until the second year I was at uni. And that was a, that was a big regret in retrospect. But I had a fantastic time. It was like the, a breakthrough moment in my life, the first mid-year conference that I went to. And in fact, it wasn't in mid-year because in those days, we had three terms. This was in the ancient times. We had, th we had three terms, and it was in, so it was in May. That was the last year of the old regime uh, before they brought in the modern world and the semester. Anyway, I went away, <laughs> and uh, I, had just, I got to know a whole bunch of people, and just being able to spend five days away getting into the Bible, uh, listening to people speaking about the message of the Bible really helped me understand the Christian faith in a, in a full way so that I, I became confident in the faith, uh, confident that I'd made a great decision in, in putting my trust in Jesus and really enabled to live for God at uni. So I'm hoping that it's going to be a similar kind of experience for you, that it will be a very encouraging time. In particular, one of the things that we really hope is that uh, this will be a time where you are able to put down deep roots into the faith where, where you are able to grow into a deep understanding of Christian faith that is going to serve you well for the rest of your life. Uh, if you're someone who is not a believer in, in Jesus, that this will help you to have a, a real understanding of uh, what would be involved in becoming a Christian. And if you are a believer, that it would establish you deeply, that you would have, have a strong faith with real depth, with real intellectual depth, but also at the same time real passion, that it would be a real and genuine experience of God. And we believe that those two things are not mutually exclusive, that actually you can study the faith and come to a deeper understanding and that that will actually fire you up to serve God in your life. That the passion and the intellect go together and one of the things that I'm praying is that as God's spirit works in our lives, uh, we'll, you'll grow both in the depth of understanding that you have and in your passion to live for God in the world. So that's what Summit is about every year, if you like. This year in particular, we're thinking about God and us. That is a question of what is God like? What is God like? And following from that, what does it then mean to have relationship with that particular God? To know that God, to worship that God, to relate to that God. So the short answer is that the God that we're talking about is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And we're going to be thinking about what does it mean to say that God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit? And then what does it mean to be in relationship with that God? So that's what we're on about this week. The, today is going to be loaded with content because we've got two talks and I've really loaded in uh, a lot of it into the first two talks. You may, depending on how familiar you are with Christian faith, feel out of your depth after a little while, but you really have the rest of the week to talk and to process and to try to uh, come to an understanding and work out how it's going to apply in your life as well. So I don't want you to worry too much. I don't want you to give up if, um, if it's too challenging or if English is your second language and it I talk too quickly or it's, you know, the, the terms are too unusual for you, then I hope that over time, over this five days, you'll have a chance to work it out. Okay, so we're on page seven in your booklets. And if you've got that open, that would be great. Most of the Bible passages there are from the English Standard Version, ESV, uh, with some others from the NRSV. But if you've got a Bible as well, then you might want to read along and get used to where these passages are in whatever version you use as well. All right, so we're asking the question, what God, which God are we talking about? And this is a good question to ask because 
It's important to realize that when we use the word God, many people mean many different things by that word or by that name. That you just simply cannot take it for granted that if you're talking with someone about God, that you're talking about the same thing. And you will have realized this, I think, if uh, you've talked to others and you've realized that actually we're talking about someone different here, that we're not on the same wavelength and that people fill that word with lots of different content and it's worth recognizing that. But for Christians, we're talking about a specific God. We're talking about uh, a, the God revealed in and by Jesus. So the place to start is with Jesus and when we talk about God, we're talking about the God revealed in and by Jesus. In other words, we need to start with the gospel, the good news about Jesus, the good news about what has happened for us through Jesus and those events of the gospel that, that reveal God are going to show us what the real God is like, what the true God is like. So in the message about Jesus, in the gospel, there is both salvation, a message of salvation, but also there is also revelation. That the same events which save us, the same events which rescue us on one hand, also reveal to us what the true God is like. The true God is revealed to us even as the true God saves us. Does that make sense? So the events of the gospel are both about our salvation, but are also a revelation of God. They show us what the true God is like. And... In the gospel, the true God is revealed to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So if you read the gospels, if you read uh, the, the account of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, as you read those, you see that there are three agents at work to save us, that there are three players in the story, if you like, that there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This was the experience of those who were with Jesus. This was the experience of the first Christians. This was what the early Christians read about as they assembled the New Testament and reflected on what it had to say about how God had saved us, that they discovered that God was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let me give you some examples of the way this comes out in the story. First of all, Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. This is Jesus' baptism. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him bodily, in bodily form, like a dove, and a voice came from heaven You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. At Jesus' baptism, there is the voice from heaven speaking to Jesus as a father and there is the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus. That in this story of salvation, there are three players, if you like, three agents, three divine figures. Then we heard, uh, read just then what happened uh, at the day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2. And here... What happens is that the followers of Jesus are gathered together. The Holy Spirit is poured out on them. They begin to speak in other languages. People want to know what is going on. What's happening here? How are these men who are from Galilee, they're not super educated guys or anything, how is it that we hear them speaking this good news in, in our own languages? What is going on here? And Peter stands up and he explains what has happened, that God was at work through Jesus his son, that Jesus died at the hands of human beings, but God the Father raised him up and made him Lord of all. And now this Jesus has received from the Father the Holy Spirit and has now poured that Spirit out. Can you hear those? the way that there are three agents at work? The Father has raised the Son and now the Son receives the Holy Spirit from the Father and has poured out the Holy Spirit on these people here. So as Peter explains the good news of what has happened, uh, he explains it in terms of Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Here is Peter writing his letter later on, uh, and this is the way he begins it, how he addresses the Christians that he's writing to, how he describes 
the Christians that he's writing to. Listen to what he says. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling with his blood. His description of the identity of these Christians, his description of their identity is very much in terms of those three, Father, the Son, Jesus and the Spirit. These are people who have been saved by God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Uh, and you find this pattern repeated again and again in the Bible. The first Christians experienced God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They were baptised into the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And as they read the Bible, as they assembled the scriptures, they found that they spoke of this God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The traditional kind of jargon name that we use for this God or the shorthand that we use for this God is that this God is the Trinity. This God is Trinity. Now this word Trinity uh, just means three or threeness. So it's actually not, uh, it shouldn't be an intimidating word for us. It's not a word that's found in the Bible, but it's just a shorthand for saying that there's a threeness about God, that God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So it's not a biblical word as such, but it's biblical in the sense that it describes the God who is revealed there. So when people talk about the Trinity, uh, that is what they're talking about. It's just a way of saving time, actually, and identifying the particular God that we're talking about. So Christians have a doctrine of the Trinity, and I'm going to describe that a bit more in a minute. But I want to talk a bit about how we got to that point, the point of speaking about God in this way. So the first Christians had an experience of Father, Son and Holy Spirit, but of course they needed to work out exactly how they were going to talk about that. They believed that there was one God. How could they then speak about God as being Father, Son and Holy Spirit? They were, by and large, faithful Jews. They were committed to the idea that there was only one God, the Lord was God alone, the creator of heaven and earth. There was only one God. And yet they had to rethink their understanding of God in the light of what had happened in Jesus. And so their first thinking in particular was about the relationship of Jesus to God the Father. Um, because they saw in the New Testament that God and Father were often used interchangeably, and Jesus uh, was, was uh, sorry. God was referred to as the God and Father of Jesus Christ. Uh, they didn't doubt that the Father was divine and that the Father was the Lord God. But what about Jesus? How, in particular, was he related? How could they speak about his relation with the Father? Well, first of all, they looked at passages like John chapter one, and John one one says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God." And the word was God. And later on in the passage printed there in your booklets, John chapter 1, verse 14, And the word became flesh and lived among us. We have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son, who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. And what they noticed was that there was a... A, an interesting way of speaking about the Son or the Word here, both identifying him with God the Father, but distinguishing him from God the Father. The Word was God, and the Word was the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Or here, close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. There was identity with God the Father, and distinction from him. Uh, for more about this, you could look at last year's summit talks. So I'm going to refer back to them a little bit. They're available online, and that was all about uh, Jesus and uh, thinking about him. So if you want to think more about this, then you can look at those talks. Or indeed, this year's NTE, which we'll hear about later on, is also going to be 
specifically uh, thinking about Jesus as God and man. So first of all, they saw that, there were, that Jesus was identified with the Father but distinguished from him at the same time. There was also the fact that Jesus was described as Lord. Jesus was given the divine title Lord. And this was another aspect of the way that they came to understand that Jesus was also divine, that Jesus also was fully God. So, for example, they knew, that this, they knew this passage from the prophet Isaiah. Listen to the way that the Lord God speaks about himself. Isaiah chapter 45, and I'm going to read verses 18 and then 21 to 23. This isn't in your booklet. Isaiah 45, 18 and 21 to 23. Thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who formed the earth and made it, I am the Lord, there is no other. There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a saviour. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Isaiah 45 is a great chapter asserting that there is only one God, the Lord, and calling on people to put their trust in that God. And where the Lord says that he will not share his glory with anyone else. He will not share his glory with any other. And so that everyone should turn to him and be saved. But then you had the, the Christian, first Christians reading this letter from the Apostle Paul, Philippians chapter 2. And what does Paul say about Jesus? Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, Jesus is Lord. He shares that divine title with the Father and he is worthy of worship. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. So here we have Jesus being affirmed as the Lord God. Um, And so uh, the first Christians came to confess that Jesus is Lord. Uh, Here is some words from the Nicene Creed uh, which uh, describe the relationship between Father and the Son. Uh, and so this is from 325 AD, and these are the words that they carefully chose to describe the relationship. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. So Jesus is united with the Father. He is of one being with the Father. He is not somehow less God than the Father, uh, but he is of of one being together with the Father, united with the Father always. Then the early Christians also had to think about the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the Son and the Father. And here they were particularly thinking about Jesus' teaching, which you guys are going to look at Uh, during this week from John chapter 15, for example, where Jesus speaks about the coming of the Spirit. Jesus speaks in this way. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Or John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another Helper to be with you forever. They noticed that the Spirit came from the Father, proceeded from the Father. And they also noticed that Jesus described the Spirit as another helper. That Jesus himself was a helper sent from God. And that the Spirit was also another helper. That is, it had the same status as Jesus himself. And could stand in for Jesus uh, without in some ways depriving the early Christians. 
They noticed in the Bible that the Spirit is personal, the Spirit speaks, the Spirit can be grieved and so on. And they noticed that the Spirit is also described as Lord. The Lord is the Spirit, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. And so in their creed, in their confession, uh, they said this, and it's printed there for you. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and with the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. So they came to confess that Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were also divine. They also had the full quality of godness, if you like, that they were of one being with the Father. And so this is the kind of language that they eventually arrived at. They tried to be very careful. Uh, they reflected and argued about it for a long time. And you see that this, was, this language... Uh, comes from 325, so it's a long time after Jesus. They had to identify a lot of wrong answers, things which were not accurate ways of speaking about God. Uh, and they had a lot of else going on. They were under persecution. They were trying to evangelise the entire world. Uh, and they had to deal with various heresies as well. And life moved slowly. There was no email in the ancient world. It wasn't until 325 that all the bishops of the churches could be gathered together to talk about this once Christianity had become legal in the Roman Empire. So it took a long time. In particular, they worked out that it was not enough just to say that God manifests himself to us in three different ways, that sometimes God comes across to us as a father and sometimes as a son and sometimes as a spirit. That These weren't just three modes of working or three modes of appearing that God had, but that we were actually here talking about three persons, as we're going to see in a minute. So the, the Christians worked hard on this to find the right language. And this is the language that they came up with, that there is one God who exists eternally as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. In particular, they said that there was one being or one essence or substance or nature, that there is a single divine nature. There's not three gods or three grades of godness there, but one divine being, one divine nature. But that there were three persons. Now, this language of person, we can find a little bit difficult. Because when we hear the word person, what do you think of? A human being? Yeah, we often just use the word to mean a human or a human being. Uh, and, we're, of course, we're not talking about human beings here. Uh, but, of course, we are saying that there is some kind of analogy between your personhood and my personhood and the personhood of the Father, personhood of the Son, personhood of the Spirit. So it doesn't mean human being. Uh, neither does it mean uh, what we sometimes mean by person, that is a separate or autonomous individual. In fact, in some ways, this way of speaking challenges our thinking about what a person actually is. And we're not talking about three personalities. We might, by the word person, we might mean personality. And we're not saying that Father, Son and Spirit have different personalities. In fact, we're saying we want to say that they're entirely united in their character, uh, that they're, they are the same in their character. But we are at least saying, when we talk about persons, that there are three centres of will or volition, uh, three a person, a person able to speak and choose and act. And yet they are entirely united in the way that they uh, that the, in the way that they speak and choose and act. They never speak or choose and act in a way that is opposed to one another. They're always united in will and purpose. So one being in three persons, or three persons in one being. In other words, God's being is a shared being. God is a unity, yes, but a complex unity, not a simple unity. That God's oneness is about unity, not about simplicity. Okay, So these are difficult concepts, but I'm just at least trying to introduce you to the language at this point. One being... Three persons. 
the immediate question that you probably want to ask is, well, how can th the three be one? How can three be one? How are they one? And that's something that we'll explore a bit more across the week. But one thing that we could initially say about that, that is that one of the ways that the early Christians spoke about this is that the three are one by mutual indwelling. That is, they noticed the language that Jesus used in his teaching. And once again, you're going to run across this as you read John 14 to 17. The language that was used was that the, uh, the Father lives in the Son and the Son lives in the Father. That they are one because of what they give and receive from each other. They're one because they live in one another. Um, and I'll leave you to explore that a bit more. But it's worth saying that we're not talking about a mathematical problem here. That We're not affirming that three equals one. That the numbers three and one refer to different things. One refers to the number of divine beings, the number of gods, and three refers to the number of persons. So three persons entirely united in one being. That is the God revealed in the gospel. Okay, well, let's, what we're going to do now is just go back and have a think about the story of the Bible from a Trinitarian perspective, that is to see Father, Son and Spirit at work and see if this helps us to make sense of what we read in the Bible and uh, how that can inform our understanding of what God is doing in saving us. So this is going backwards, if you like, going back to the beginning and having a look at the whole story again. First of all, uh, it's worth pointing out that when we talk about God as Father, Son and Spirit, we're talking about how God has always been, how God has always existed as Father, Son and Spirit. That This is not something that God became at some point. This is not something that happened to God in the process of saving us, but something that God has always been. So, for example, Jesus, John chapter 17, speaking to the Father in prayer, you loved me before the foundation of the world. That there was always a God who is Father, Son and Spirit, that the Father, Son and Spirit have been an eternal relationship of love even before the world was made. And this is going to have huge implications for our thinking, um, especially as we come to the fourth talk. But I want to mention it here um, just to say that the God who made the world uh, has always been, is eternally Father, Son and Holy Spirit. In creation, we see uh, God, Father, Son and Spirit working in a particular way. First of all, that the Father creates the world through his Son, through his Word. So, for example, John chapter 1, verse 1, again, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Or Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, For by him all things were created, this is Jesus, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, For us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. The Father is the initiator. Uh, he is the one who begins the work of creation, but he creates the world through his Son, and he creates it through his son in the power of his spirit. So, for example, in Genesis chapter 1, we see that the spirit at work. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The spirit of God is there at work, uh, empowering the work of creation. A couple of verses from the Psalms which show the spirit at work in creation. Psalm 104, verse 30. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. Or Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth, or the spirit of his mouth. So that the, both the word and the spirit 
at work in the creation of the world. God the Father creates the world through his Son and in the power of his Holy Spirit. Then in the story of salvation, we see the Father, Son and Spirit at work. First of all, I want you to notice that uh, God promises in the Old Testament that he himself is going to come and rescue his people. There are promises that God himself is going to rescue his own people. So, for example, Ezekiel chapter 34, uh, a great passage about what God is going to do for his lost sheep. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I'll bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them into their own land. I'll feed them with good pasture. Uh, And later on he says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I'll bring back the strayed and I'll bind up the injured. And I'll strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I'll feed them in justice. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. So the Lord God promises that he's going to come himself and rescue his people. And in the coming of Jesus, that is what is going on. And so uh, what happens is... uh, In what we usually call the incarnation, the Father sends his Son into the world by the power of his Holy Spirit. Can you see a pattern emerging here? The Father sends his Son into the world by the power of his Holy Spirit. And it's one of those divine persons, the Son, not the Father, not the Spirit, who takes humanity to himself, who uh, becomes a human being by the power of the Spirit. So, for example, in uh, Luke's account, uh, the angel says to Mary, and now you will conceive in your womb and you'll bear a son and you'll name him Jesus. He'll be great and he'll be called Son of the Most High and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel... Good question. How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born in you will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And similarly, Matthew chapter 1, angel speaking to Joseph. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. John chapter 1, the word became flesh and lived among us. So what is happening in the conception and birth of Jesus is that the Holy Spirit, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Son of God is becoming one of us, adding humanity to his godness uh, in one person. In the ministry of Jesus, we see the Father and Son and Spirit at work together. We saw that in the baptism of Jesus. And then as Jesus' ministry continues, Jesus serves the Father, does the Father's will by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus casts out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus works miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, Jesus rejoices in the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives commands through the Holy Spirit, to the apostles, and so on. That is, that Jesus' ministry is a ministry empowered by the Holy Spirit. God, the Father, sends his Son into the world, and the Son, empowered by the Spirit, ministers to the world. And that finishes up, uh, in particular, in Jesus' death on the cross. And so what we understand happening here is that the Father sends his Son to uh, to be the sacrifice for our sins, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Son offers himself as a sacrifice to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, How much more will the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. To really properly understand what's happening when Jesus dies on the cross, you need to understand it in Trinitarian terms. The Son offering himself to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. That Jesus is enabled to do that by the Spirit at work in him. And then Jesus, having died, is raised to life uh, by the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. So... For example, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Jesus really died. He could not raise himself on his own, but he was raised by the Father who, uh, through his spirit, the same spirit that he gives to Christians, raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus was enabled to have life in himself just as the Father has life in himself. Jesus raised up by the power of the Spirit. And then as we heard in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit is poured out, the Spirit sent from the Father through the Son on the people who belong to Jesus the Son. Uh, Similarly, Titus chapter 3 speaks about the Holy Spirit who God poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. So I just want you to notice that in the story, Father, Son and Spirit are at work and Father, Son and Spirit have a particular way of working. That the Father is the initiator. The Father is the one who gets things going. The Father is the one who kicks things off and he tends to work through his Son and through his Spirit. Uh, one of the early Christians called Irenaeus spoke in this way. He said that the, in, in action, in God's actions, the Son and the Spirit are like the two hands of the Father. The Father creates the world through his Son and in the power of his Spirit. God saves the world through his Son and in the power of his Holy Spirit. As we're going to see, God rescues the world and brings it back to himself through his Son, and in the power of the Spirit. You see the way that that works. And uh, this has some relation, uh, as we read the Bible, some relation to God's own eternal relationships, that the the Spirit proceeds from the Father, the Son is begotten of the Father, and those, those relationships of origin are reflected in the way that God acts in the world. What this means is that there's an appropriateness in the, in the way that God saves us. If God created the world through his Son and in the power of his Spirit, then it's not somehow alien to what the world is like, that, the, that God then saves the world by sending his Son into the world by the power of his Spirit to rescue his world. That's what God does. Okay, well, just a couple of comments about this God. If Christians believe in this God, uh, I hope you can see that this God is a surprising God. This God is a surprising... This is not the God that you would have expected. This is not the God that you would have arrived at by rational deduction, like the one God of the Greek philosophers. It's not to say that this God is irrational, but this is not what you would have arrived at just by working, trying to work from first principles about what... God must be like. Uh, This is not the God that you can arrive at also through empirical research. That certainly the actions of God are open to some to scrutiny because they're real actions in our world. But this is not a God who can be examined in that way. That if God is personal, then God can be known as a person and only ultimately as a person. not studied and in such a way that you arrive at an understanding. This is a surprising God, a God who no one would have ever guessed was the true God. 
And yet, as we see God in action in the world, uh, revealed to be the true God. But more than surprising, this is, I think, a delightful God. A delightful God. And we're going to really think about this more through the week. That is, this God is a God of loving relationship. This God is a God who is eternally a relationship of love. And that is a delightful, delightful God. Uh, One of the words that uh, Christian thinkers use to describe this relationship of God, this way of being that God has as Father, Son and Spirit, uh, is a strange word, a Greek word, perichoresis. And it's a word for a circular dance. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the circular dance, right? Have you ever been to a Greek wedding? I got invited to a Greek wedding. It was so fantastic, right? And uh, what they do is, you, you know, you might have seen the circular dance, but uh, everyone at the wedding, uh, you know, eats, eats, drink, 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 eat, 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 drink. And then you get together, right, and you put your arms over each other's shoulders and you start to do this, you know, the Zorba, Zorba the Greek kind of dance. And it's astounding. It's, it's mesmerising. It, it goes on forever. Right? It, it must, I, I, I thought, I saw it happen, right, and I was just sitting there, I thought, I'm not going to get into it. But someone persuaded me, okay, next time it starts, you get into it. And it must have gone an hour, an hour and a half, right? I'm just, you're just there. And you, once you're in, you can't get out. You can't, you can't, you can't say, I uh, just, you know, just got to pop out for a drink. No, uh, you're in, right? You're in. And it just goes on and on. And there's little kids, there's grandmas and grandpas and everyone in between it's and it was just fantastic everyone is smiling you know even the guys who get drunk they they're just stuck right <laughs> they, they just it was it was awesome right it was awesome this was this is the way this is the way that uh, they found to describe the eternal life of God was like the circular dance the father son and spirit uh, who give and receive life from each other who love one another forever that's the delightful God, the true God revealed in the gospel. This is very exciting. This is very exciting that the true God should be like this. And getting to know this God, which is what we're going to talk about next, getting to know this God, also very exciting, a great privilege to get to know this God who is eternally a relationship of love. What does it matter? Well, there's a whole bunch of implications that we're going to look at this week. Uh, First of all, we're going to, it means that uh, as you get to know Jesus, you get to know the true God. If Jesus is God the Son, then true knowledge of God is available through him. It also means that if you've been saved by Jesus and if you have the Holy Spirit in your life, then you have been saved by the true God. You're not somehow distant from the true God. We're going to think about that more. If this God is at the heart of reality, if this God who is a relationship, is at the heart of reality. This is going to have huge implications for what we think about reality. And we're going to look at that in the fourth talk. If this is the true God, uh, who is the God of love, then this is going to have huge implications for the way that we serve, seek to serve and speak about God in the world. That's what we're going to think about in the fifth talk. And also in the fifth talk, we're going to think about the implications for our thinking about eternity are thinking about heaven what does it mean to to talk about going to heaven if god is like this so we're going to explore the entire christian faith if you like from the understanding that god is father son and holy spirit let's pray and then we'll sing i think Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the way that you have sent your Son into the world to show us what you are like, to rescue us from our rebellion, to bring us to you. We thank you so much for pouring out your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you have shown yourself to be the surprising and delightful God. We pray that you'd please be with us this week 
that you please help us in our thinking to understand you better and to love you more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.